Hi, my name is Adam, and I'm here to present to you the uh, algorithm that I and my co-author, Andrea Lincoln, developed to solve the problem of random KCNF sat uh, faster. So, first of all, what is KCNF sat? Well, sat is satisfiability. So it's the problem of, given a formula, which is some collection of literals uh, that are joined together by ands, ors, and nots, so the, this overbar means not, this uh, v means or, and this upside down v means and. So given a formula of this kind where you have a bunch of literals, is there a mapping of literals to values true and false that will make the overall formula evaluate to true when you simplify things out? And if, if such a mapping of literals to true or false values exists that will cause the formula to become true, then the formula is said to be satisfiable. And uh, if no such mapping exists, then the formula is said to be unsatisfiable. Um, and uh, yeah, so satisfiable is a problem of identifying formulas as satisfiable or unsatisfiable. It's a famous NP-hard problem. Um, so C KCNF sat is just a small wrinkle in the satisfiability uh, problem, which is KCNF sat is telling you that your, your formula has to be organized into a bunch of clauses that are all joined together by ands. Each clause is itself an or of a bunch of literals, and each clause must contain exactly k literals each. So uh, k is the number of literals per clause, m is the number of clauses, and n is the number of variables. So that's, that's just what KCNF set means. So the question we're trying to solve is, is the formula satisfiable? So uh, there's some um, worst case running the al algorithms for KCNF set. So this is, this, is, this is in the worst case. As you can see, many of these algorithms have different runtimes for k equals 3, but in the limit of large k, they all look the same. They all have the same, you know, asymptotic in k uh, runtime as k gets large. But of course, you know, some of them are better than others for finite k. So um, these are some... Worst case algorithms for KSAT. Now we're interested in uh, random KCNF sat. So random KCNF sat is not the, the worst case version, but instead it's when your input is chosen to be just a, 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 a random formula chosen from all possible formulas. Um, so the way you generate a clause at random is you, you, you form every clause by kicking, picking k literals iid uniformly at random from all the 2n possible literals, n because there's n different variables, and then 2n because they, each one could have an overbar on top of it, you know, indicating not that literal, or there's no not. Um, so those are the two n possibilities. So random KCNF sat is just, it's, it's, it's the same as the, 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 the random, uh, as opposed to worst case, means that the, the formulas aren't particularly hard. They're just uh, chosen at random from all possible formulas, as opposed to worst case, where like if you specify an algorithm, you're given the worst possible formula for that algorithm. Um, so our, our algorithm is not designed to work in the worst case. It's only designed to work in the random case. Um, great, so that's random KCNF sat. So, uh, random KCNF sat. So the first thing to know about random KCNF sat is this notion of the threshold. So this is a concept that uh, people have uh, thought about in the last few decades. But basically, random KCNF sat is really easy outside of a very particular uh, set of m, n, and k. So given an n and a k, there's uh, a value m below which, like, so m remembers the number of clauses. So if the number of clauses is too small, then the then almost all formulas are going to be satisfiable. Because remember, the more clauses you have, the more difficult it is to find a satisfying assignment. Because you need to satisfy all of the clauses for your assignment to be considered satisfying. So if there's very few clauses, almost all assignments will be satisfying. And if there's a ton of clauses, then almost no uh, uh, assignments will be satisfying. So basically, there's this very narrow band in which the problem is interesting. And you can't sort of dismiss every, every formula out of hand as being satisfiable or unsatisfiable. And outside of this band, the problem just isn't very interesting because you know before even uh, looking at it with high probability that the formula is either going to be satis unsatisfiable um, in the case where the number of clauses is too high or satisfiable in the case where the number of clauses is too low. So we only, we're only focusing on this, this, uh, this particular band of the uh, number of clauses because outside of this band, the problem is just, uh, just uninteresting. You can, you can give the right answer with high probability without doing any computation. Uh, so anyways, uh, the goal of our research is to find the algorithm, the fastest algorithm at the threshold. Um, so these results fa found that the threshold uh, was at this particular function of k and n. So m here, the number of clauses, depends on k and n uh, basically like this, uh, with it, where this epsilon is some vanishing number. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's, that's the threshold. Um, so at the threshold, there are some algorithms uh, that do random case at. 
And as you can see, so a bunch of these are worst case algorithms. So as you can see, you know, they're, they're just the worst case algorithms using the random case. They don't get any improvement, unsurprisingly. And then recently there have been a couple new algorithms that get a small improvement. You get this extra log k in the exponent. And ours, our algorithm is going to improve slightly upon these two algorithms. So it's, it's going to be better than any of these lists, any, than any in this list by a little bit. Um, right. So first of all, before we explain our algorithm, we're going to explain the algorithm of Schrodinger and Danson. So Schrodinger and Danson are, are a couple, th th these are both worst case algorithms, but they're, they provide sort of a template for the algorithm we use. So our, our algorithm is, is basically a small modification of their algorithm that uh, yields a small improvement in run, in run time in the random case. So the algorithm of Schrodinger and Danson is actually very simple, fortunately. Um, the way it works is you randomly sample a bunch of assignments. Um, so that's what this is saying. And then you search locally around for a satisfying assignment. But uh, you may be asking, wait, why is, how, how is that faster than exhaustive search? It's, 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 it's not obvious why this would be faster than exhaustive search, because you're still searching in the neighborhood of, of, of you know, it, it feels like you're going to have to search everything. Um, it, it shouldn't give any improvements to just randomly sample a bunch of assignments and then search locally in the neighborhood of each. But the key is that there's a small optimization you can do when you're doing a local search around an assignment. And I'll explain that now. Basically, the idea is suppose so this, is, this is just a little toy problem um, where you have five clauses, each of size two. Now, obviously, two sat is easy. On, you know, it's, 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 it, it, there's actually a polynomial time algorithm for two sat, but um, if you'll bear with me, this is just a, an example to illustrate. So suppose we have five clauses of size two, and we decide to look at the particular assignment of false to everything. So uh, we can see that we can, you know, we, 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 we satisfied four out of five of the clauses, but the fifth clause is not satisfied. So, you know, uh, we, 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 we failed to, to find a satisfying assignment this time, but we're going to keep looking. Now, one thing we could do to, to keep looking is we could try flipping y to true. That would be a reasonable thing to try. Or try flipping z to true. Both of those are reasonable things to try to, to see if that, that would result in a satisfying assignment. One thing that would not be a reasonable thing to try is to try flipping x to true. Because if you look at the clauses that weren't satisfied, there's one clause that wasn't satisfied, and it said y or z. So flipping x can't possibly cause our formula to become satisfied because this clause just doesn't depend on x. So there's no point in looking at the assignment of x to true, y to false, z to false, before we even look at it. We know that it's going to fail because it's not going to satisfy this last clause. So basically the way you can do local search a little bit more efficiently than you would do exhaustive search is uh, you look at the, the, you know, one of the clauses that isn't satisfied and you just flip some literal that's in that clause. But there's no point in flipping a literal that doesn't exist in any unsatisfied clause because you know that that can't possibly solve your problem. And so that's, that's where the inefficiency of exhaustive search comes in. So uh, basically, this, this optimization lets you do a uh, local search uh, in a Hamming ball of size alpha n in order of k to the alpha n time. Now, before, I, I'll just explain briefly what I mean by Hamming ball. Basically, like if you, so this, this is all, imagine this is all the assignments of size three. So a Hamming ball of radius one centered at the false true false uh, assignment would look like this. So it's just, it's just all three of the assignments that are at Hamming distance one or less away from this assignment. So that's, that's all I mean. So basically, you can, you can search a Hamming ball of size, uh, R, uh, of, of size alpha n or less in order of k to the alpha n time. So uh, that's, that's the, what, the, what Schrodinger and Zanson noticed, and that's how they were able to get an improvement on the exhaustive search algorithm. So the way their algorithm works is, you know, so you're, you're going to a bunch of local searches, and each local search, so each local search case takes k to the alpha n time. You're going to need 2 to the n over n choose alpha n samples before you covered almost all of the space, um, or all of the space. So uh, the overall, uh, so there's, there's this trade-off where, like, the, if, if your alpha is too big, then your searches are going to take too long because you're searching too big of a hamming ball. But if your alpha is too small, then you're going to need to do too many different searches. So... Basically, the alpha that uh, optimizes this value turns out to be alpha equals uh, is this theta of 1 over k, which will give you an algorithm that takes this amount of time. So remember, this isn't our algorithm. This is the algorithm of Dan Schering and Danson that we're going to um, slightly modify to get, get our improvement. Um, so right, this is when alpha is theta of 1 over k. So our algorithm is almost the same, um, but it just has the simple optimization that instead of searching in the neighborhood of every assignment that we sample, we're only going to search in the, in the neighborhood of the good assignments. So we're going to sample some assignments, and then we're going to look at them. Um, and before we perform an expensive local search in the neighborhood of that assignment, we're going to determine if it's likely that that assignment is actually close to a satisfying assignment. Because, like, if you think about it, there's no point in trying to search in the neighborhood of hopeless-seeming uh, uh, assignments. Like, if your assignment just, like, you know, looks like it's really far from actually satisfying the formula, there's no point in looking in the neighborhood of that assignment, because probably you won't get anywhere. It's a lot more efficient 
to just uh, do a, a, a nice, simple test before searching and um, uh, only only search in the neighborhood, uh, neighborhood assignments if it passes your test. Um, so the test we're using is, is, is we're going to use the number of clauses that are satisfied by a given assignment. So just to, I'll, I'll do a small work example just so, so you understand what I'm talking about. So imagine we have this, uh, this uh, version of the problem. So we have these six clauses and we're trying to satisfy all six of them at once. So as you can, so just at a glance, you can see that the satisfying assignment to this problem is going to be x equals true, y equals true, z equals true, because all six of these clauses contain a true literal. In any case, um, so this, this, this assignment right here is false, 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 so it's got a, a Hamming distance of three from the satisfying assignment, and it's, it's, it's satisfying all the clauses except one. And so if we try looking at all the other assignments, our, you know, the, the, our distance from the satisfying assignment is going to vary, the, the number of unsatisfied clauses we have is also going to vary, um, but uh, eventually we'll find the satisfying assignment, and it'll have zero unsatisfied clauses. And basically what we're proposing to do is we're proposing, so if, if we put everything into a table, this left column is the, the distance of each assignment from the satisfying assignment in Hamming distance. And the right column is the number of unsatisfied clauses, the number of clauses left unsatisfied by each assignment. And basically our idea is that the right column is a very noisy proxy for the left column. In this case, this is sort of a bad example because it's an extremely noisy proxy. There's not, it's not clear there's any signal at all here. But in general, there's actually, you know, assignments that are close to satisfying assignment are generally going to uh, satisfy more clauses, are going to leave fewer clauses unsatisfied. And assignments that are very far from the satisfying assignment are generally going to leave more clauses unsatisfied. Now, in the worst case, the only guarantee you have is that like the, there's going to be a zero zero row to this this table? The the, the 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 satisfying assignment itself is guaranteed to leave no clauses unsatisfied. But in the worst case, you know the 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 formula could look really crazy, and the number of unsatisfied clauses might just not depend on the distance from the satisfying assignment at all. Which is why we need to consider only the random case. So our own algorithm only works in the random case because this 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 correlation basically only works in the random case. This this is a small enough example that it's not very convincing. But here's a, a slightly larger empirical example. So this is three literals per clause, eight different variables, and m different, uh, 37 different clauses. Um, and this is a scatter plot of just like, for each assignment, how many clauses were left unsatisfied by that assignment, and what was the Hamming distance from the satisfying assignment of that assignment. And as you can see, uh, for this particular formula, which you know is too big for me to show, but the, the, the point is you, you get this scatter plot and there's a pretty clear positive correlation between the Hamming distance from the satisfying assignment and the number of clauses left unsatisfied. And so the idea is that uh, this, you know, in fact, the number of clauses left unsatisfied actually is a pretty good proxy for your distance from the satisfying assignment. It's, it's an okay proxy. It's better than nothing. So the idea of our, our, our algorithm is just going to be, um, we're only going to search the neighborhood of uh, assignments that satisfy more than the average number of clauses, like a, a, an abnormally large number of clauses. So we're going, we have some threshold T above which we consider it worth our while to do an expensive local search. So if, 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 if our, the assignment that we sampled satisfies at least T clauses, where T is this complicated threshold right here, then we're going to bother to do the local search, and otherwise we'll just throw it away and sample again. So our threshold is given by this formula, which, which depends on alpha, and alpha is, is given by this, it's, alpha is this monstrosity. Look in the paper to see why we chose these numbers, but these numbers happen to be the ones that optimize uh, the uh, running time of our algorithm. So that's, that's the point. Um, so, uh, right, so that's, that, that, that's our algorithm. So, we randomly sample assignments. If, they assi if, if, if the assignment satisfies an abnormally large number of clauses, only then do we do an expensive local search for a satisfying assignment. And then if we, if, if, if we spent uh, at least this much time having failed to find a satisfying assignment, then we assume there is no satisfying assignment, and we return no, the, the formula isn't satisfiable. Right, so um, basically like the way we do our analysis, we use the language of st statistics to uh, talk about the various different assignments. So we, we call we, we classify each assignment into either a true negative, a false positive, a false negative, or a true positive. So a, a true negative would be an assignment that's neither um, satisfying an abnormally large number of clauses, nor is it close to a satisfying assignment. So that's, that's the blue part of this, this graph. Whereas a true positive would be an assignment that both satisfies an abnormally large number of clauses and uh, is close to a satisfying assignment. And the idea basically is that, like, you know, if you, if, 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 if you look at uh, the set of... Uh, True positives, the, 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 basically the, the, this black line is going to be the threshold between positives and negatives. So the, the, everything above this black line, we're going to bother doing expensive, an expensive local search for. And everything be below it, we're going to throw away. So everything in this Gaussian down here is stuff that if we were to do a local search for it, then we would be in business. That means that we would uh, find the satisfying assignment if we were to do a local search around one of these assignments. Whereas in, in the larger group of assignments that don't belong to this sub-distribution, 
we would not find a satisfying assignment. So basically, like, by restricting ourselves to only the things uh, that are to the right of this black line, we have a higher ratio of, uh, you know, diamonds to chaff, where the, the green is the diamonds and the orange is the chaff. But then if we were looking at the entire distribution, where, like, this, the, this small distribution would be the diamonds, and this overall big uh, bell curve would be the chaff. Yeah, if, so if, if we zoom in on this, this bell curve right here, we can see that it's, uh, you know, more of it is on the right half of the, the black line than on the left half, which is what we want. So uh, how fast is our algorithm going to be? Well, it depends on the, the true positive rate and the false positive rate. Well, first of all, uh, before we, uh, the, 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 the runtime of our algorithm is going to be at least one over the, the true positive rate, because we need to uh, do roughly that number, number of samples before we even find something that will get us to the result. But also, we're going to waste, basically the second term in the sum is the amount of time we waste doing pointless searches. So the, the number of false positives and the number of true, true positives times k to the alpha n, which is the, the cost of a local search. Um, so how can we bound the false positive rate, so the, the, the rate at which there are assignments that are, uh, that both have, uh, uh, that, are bo that both satisfy an abnormally large number of clauses, but also aren't close to the satisfying assignment? Uh, from above, so we want to bound this, val this, this value from above, and we want to bound this, that bound this value, value, for, value from below. So first, I'll explain how to bound the false positive rate. So this is actually quite simple. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of the math, but you can just use a, a tail bound, basically, to do this. The point is that the number of uh, assignments that, that satisfy an abnormally large number of clauses is, uh, is, is it's going to be a binomial that's centered at this m over 2 to the k uh, Number basically like this is go the, this is the average number of uh, clauses that are left unsatisfied by a random assignment, and so only a small number of assignments are going to have much more than this number of uh, unsatisfied clauses. So you can just use a simple tail bound to bound the false positive rate from above. So the way we bound the true positive rate is a little bit trickier. So instead of working with the true distribution over formulas, we work with what we call the planted distribution for analysis because it makes things much easier. And then we relate things to the true distribution, we relate the planted distribution to the true distribution. But I'll explain what I mean by the planted distribution now. So the way the planted distribution works is you start with an assignment that uh, is the satisfying assignment, like, or is, a, is an assignment you want to be a satisfying assignment. Like, suppose we started with this assignment as our satisfying assignment. Um, and then you generate the clauses around this assignment, basically. So, you know, maybe I would generate at random x and y to be the two variables that get used in this clause. But given that I want this to be the satisfying assignment, I have to choose clauses for one of these three, rather than like including all four possibilities. So I, I'm, I'm trying x or y, x or not y, not x or y, but not not x or not y. Because I'm, I'm excluding that one because that one would be would violate uh, th this assignment would violate that clause, which is something I don't want. I want this clause to be a satisfying assignment in the formula that I generate. So this is the plans to is a particular way of generating satisfiable assignments. Any any uh, any formula you generate. According using this method is guaranteed to be satisfiable because the assignment that you built it around will, will be uh, will satisfy. It. That's just a guarantee. The problem with analyzing uh, the planted distribution as uh, the real distribution over all possible formulas that are satisfiable is because actually the planted distribution overweights formulas that have many solutions. Because basically, what I did to generate this formula was I started with a solution and then I generated a formula around it. And I'm likelier to land on formulas that have lots of solutions by a factor of the number of solutions they have, because, you know, there's more ways for me to get there. So basically, this is the main, this is the crux of the issue uh, in bounding the number of true positives from below. Um, once you have this notion of the planted distribution, if, if we were drawing formulas from the planted distribution, everything would be easy, um, because uh, you could just use a tail bound, just like we do false positives, and prove every, every, everything just like you'd want. Unfortunately, the plant distribution is not the same as the, the true distribution, so instead what we have to do is we have to show that the plant distribution isn't too different from the, the real distribution. That's basically what we do in our paper. We, have, uh, we relate the two distributions together. Um, this is a useful concept to know about, I think, in general, when trying to attack this problem. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the main challenge of bounding the true positive rate. I think you can look at our paper for the details of how exactly we relate these two distributions to one another. Just to remind you, this is our algorithm. And uh, it turns out that it yield gets a, a runtime that's uh, this, which is uh, a little bit better than the previous best. So recall that the previous best had this uh, O of two, 2 to the n times 1 minus omega of log k over k. So we get a, a second log in the numerator, um, another log factor in the numerator. 
which uh, makes our algorithm a little bit faster. So, uh, yeah. Um, I think it's a pretty interesting line of research. Uh, there's a lot of ways one could improve upon it. In particular, I think uh, our, the, the test we're using for our algorithm, right, is pretty crude. Um, our test is just taking the number of clauses and uh, looking at the number of clauses that are left unsatisfied to, to, to be a proxy for how far you are from the satisfying assignment. When you think about it, like, you know, there's a lot more information there that we're not using. Like, for example, we're not using how close to satisfied various unsatisfied, various satisfied clauses, how close to unsatisfied various satisfied clauses are. There's just, like, a lot of room to try much more sophisticated tests than the one we're using. The one, the test we're using is a fairly blunt instrument, I would say. Now, I will say, actually, that, like, my co-author and I, we did try other tests, uh, smarter tests, more complex ones, in the hopes that they would yield an asymptotic improvement. But according to our analysis, they didn't. But I, I would be surprised if there wasn't a way to improve upon our result with an even more sophisticated test. Basically, like, you know, the, the, the test we're using is, is very computationally cheap. Um, so there's room for something that's much more complex um, and potentially could yield a, a drastic improvement in the runtime of this algorithm. In particular, if you get a sufficiently high uh, probability of true positive or probability of false positive ratio, then there's a possibility of violating the random strong exponential time hypothesis, or R random Seth, um, which is just the, the hypothesis in the limit of large k, the base of this exponent here, uh, can't possibly be, possibly be less than 2. So, like, you know, if you believe this hypothesis, then there's no way of doing it, but, uh, you know, it, it seems plausible to me that there should be some tests that exists that uh, gets a high, sufficiently high ratio that you could get this uh, asymptotic behavior to be, you know, even less than 2 to the n in the limit of large k, which would be exciting and impressive. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you for listening to my talk. Uh, and...